Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when standing before Pilate, kept silent at all the unjust accusations and slanders of the Jews, and as a gentle lamb that did not open its mouth, did not con contradict them when they brought forward their charges against you. Give me grace never to be disturbed by the false accusations of others, but may I overcome every injury by silence and meekness. Give me the grace of perfect humility, so that I may never desire praise nor refuse any measure of contempt. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, you, Lamb without spot, against whom the pious Pharisees and scribes raged with obstinate hatred. For although Pilate testified that he found no cause of death in you, yet they would not be satisfied with anything except your death. Grant me grace to imitate your innocence and patience, that I may both lead a godly life, and for so doing, if I am spoken of evilly, that I may remain at rest in you, giving way to no indignation, but giving thanks to you in all adversity. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who were led in great, the greatest of indignity, in the manner of a wicked criminal through the middle of the city, from one judgment seat to another, and from Pilate to Herod and back again, amidst the noise and shouts of the people. Give me grace never to be overcome by the injuries of my enemies, nor to be exasperated by slander. May I never feel any false shame at being despised, but may I receive everything in meekness and endure all things in silence for your honour, that, by the assistance of your grace, I may in patience possess my soul. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when Herod asked you many vain and foolish questions, and when you were falsely wounded in different ways by priest and scribe, humbly kept a meet and becoming silence. Give me grace to restrain my tongue in a manner well-pleasing to you. Do not permit me to utter hurtful words. Do not permit me to be taken up with fruitless stories. But give me grace to say what is right, profitable and honest, according to your will. May I abhor the, the sin of evil speaking, and be always glad to think and speak well of any man. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who condemned by your silence the foolish curiosity of Herod, and who would not gratify his curious eyes by the performance of any miracle, because he did not have his own salvation at heart, and did there, there in this way teach us to avoid all ostentation before the great ones of this world. Pour into my heart a spirit of deep humility, mortify and quench within me any desire for vain glory. Grant that I may never do anything in order to gain praise of man, but may always act with a single eye upon the glory of your most holy name, and may come before you day by day in a true spirit of humility and meekness. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who didn't refuse to be set to nothing by Herod and his men of war, nor to be clothed in a white garment and to be mocked and laughed at as though a fool and a madman. Give me grace, O Lord, to choose rather to be an outcast with you than to be glorious in the world. May I think it better and more honourable to suffer reproach for your name than to prosper in the vain honours of the world. Give me grace that, truly acknowledging my own sins and my own unworthiness, I may be as nothing in my own sight, but may always despise and accuse myself and daily lament over my own weakness and wretchedness. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was sent back with shame, clothed in a fool's garment from Herod the Pilate, and in all things obeyed your enemies going backwards and forwards according to their pleasure. 
Grant that I may not shrink from being despised, nor refuse obedience even to those who wish nothing but bad for me. Give me grace to have no feeling for the things of this world, but to think of and care for and love you alone. May you alone be my honour, my delight, my love, my glory, and my joy. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths will sing your praise.
The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 16. I have told you all these things, so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yet a time is coming when the one who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. But I have told you these things, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told you about them. I did not tell you these things from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking me, Where are you going? Instead, your hearts are filled with sadness because I have said these things to you. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I am going away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong concerning sin, righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but will speak whatever he hears, and will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me, because he will receive from me what is mine, and will tell it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what is mine, and will tell it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The great aim of the Lord Jesus in his final conversations with his apostles was to convince them of their perfect union with himself. They were the branches of the living vine. They were his beloved and confidential friends. Were these revelations made merely to assure them of privilege, merely to make them happy in the consciousness of an honourable and inseparable relation? Absolutely not. This spiritual fellowship was to be the power for holy service and the motive to patient endurance. It is in this last respect that, in the verses before us, our Lord reply, relied upon the revelation already made as sufficient to secure his disciples from being offended with him. He felt that, having explained the community of life and interest subsisting between himself and his own, he might open up before them the prospect of persecution. Forewarned, they would thus be forearmed. He treated them herein not as children, but as soldiers in a spiritual war, whose allegiance he did not doubt, and of whose fortitude he was most perfectly assured. It was no new thing in the world that men should be pursued with bitter hostility for their devotion to truth, to duty, to righteousness to God. The history of Israel contained but too many illustrations of the animosity with which the good had been assailed by those to whom their life and testimony were a rebuke. Jesus foresaw that confessors and martyrs were to render a service in his kingdom, both by establishing the faith upon a basis of hard trial and proof, and by extending the truth amongst unbelievers. Jesus here refers to two ways in which his disciples could experience the hostility of an unbelieving world. Doubtless the reference here is to the Jews. Even during our Lord's ministry, those who confessed him were in some instances excluded from the synagogue. 
And when the church was constituted by the descent of the Spirit, and especially when the broad designs of Christianity as a religion, not for Israel only, but for mankind in, in total, were clearly exhibited, then the hostility of the bigoted among the Jewish leaders and the Jewish populace would know no bounds. Reverencing everything connected with the law and the prophets, the preachers of Christ would fain have resorted to the synagogues of old, would fain have reasoned out of scriptures with a view of proving that Jesus was the Messiah and of showing how his religion realised all the types and predictions of Judaism. But the merit and the glory of Christianity was, in the eyes of the legalist and the formalist, its chief offence, and a sharp line was drawn over which the followers of the Nazarene were not allowed to step. The Jews did, as we know from the record of the Acts of the Apostles, even in the very earliest years of the history of the Christian faith, carry out their hostility so far as to inflict capital punishment upon a Christian advocate, as exampled by St Stephen. But it seems as if our Lord in this prediction is looking further forward to events which would follow the proclamation of the gospel amongst the Gentiles. The annals of the Church of Christ are rich indeed with instances of martyrdom, and it has passed into a proverb that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the Church. Our Lord conceded that the motive to much of the persecution that should assail the professors of the faith was a conscientious and even religious motive. Events have confirmed this. No doubt there have been persecutors who have acted from interested or selfish motives. But there have been those who persecute Christians in the belief that they were doing God a service and the years of St. Paul before his conversion are a particular example of this, offering to him an acceptable sacrifice in the blood of the faithful unto death. The Jews particularly were in many instances influenced in their hostility to Christians by a reverence for what they believed, however erroneously, to be the perfect religion capable of no addition and no improvement. The professions and claims made first by Jesus and later by his servants on his behalf were of a very high and authoritative character. Christ was either the Son of God or he was an out-and-out -out blasphemer. And we know that the latter view was taken by many of the Jewish unbelievers. It is no justification of evil conduct that those guilty of it are sincere, yet sincere ignorance is an extenuation even if it is not a vindication of guilt. Alas, what evils have been wrought in the name not only of liberty, but also of religion. Our Lord was a revealer of hearts. He looked upon the profession even below the belief. He penetrated deep into the spiritual desire of men and was familiar with the hidden springs of thought and of action. There was a reason, not necessarily known in every case by the agents themselves, for the actions they would commit. The Lord was able to account for conduct by searching this inner nature and in so doing he discovered in the spiritual ignorance of the persecutor the true and all-sufficient reason for their attitude and proceedings. They have not known the Father nor me, he said. They cannot know Christ by the knowledge, that is, of spiritual appreciation and sympathy, who persecute and slay his friends and the promulgators of his faith. They not only do not know, but they totally misunderstand him, his character and his mission if they suppose that God can be pleased when Christians are persecuted. 
for it is not to be believed that the father can look with satisfaction upon injuries done to his own son in the person of his followers. Had the Jews known Christ, they would not have slain the Lord of glory. None who truly knew our Lord could have possibly persecuted his faithful people in order to do his father service. There was a sympathy between our Lord and his apostles, but that sympathy was not perfect. Even in the latest of these quiet conversations between master and disciple, it is evident that the perception of the learners was now and again very dull, and that their response to what he was saying was somewhat inadequate. There is a tone of expostulation, almost of rebuke, in this as in other portions of his recorded discourse. Concerning himself, Jesus had uttered language with both perplexed and distressed his friends. He had spoken of his approaching departure, a prospect which could not but grieve them, and which clearly depressed his hearers. Their life was bound up in his life, and separation could not be faced without the sinking of heart. Concerning the apostles, the Lord had opened a prospect which dismayed or at least disconcerted them. He had told them very plainly now that they would be both hated and persecuted. And such an outlook as this could only be gloomy. They were not prepared at this stage for enduring such tribulations especially were they to be deprived of the presence and support, visible and tangible, of their master. Sorrow, said to Jesus, has filled your heart. He had opened the conversation by asking them to trust in him and to dismiss fear and trouble from their mind. He had given them reasons for confidence, grounds for hope, motives for peace, but they, in turn, were conscious of their feeble nature, their dependence upon him. They had accordingly no thoughts but for themselves, and as they looked at one another, they must have felt that there was among them no one upon whom they could lean in the absence of the Lord. And he was going and he would be going soon. How could they possibly keep together? And if they should keep together, what was there going to be for them to do? Had not the Master done everything? Without him, where would be the meaning of their fellowship, the purpose of their life? One thinks of the problems at the foot of Mount Tabor after the Transfiguration, when Jesus returned to discover the disciples unable to heal. It is a proof of the reality of their attachment to Jesus, of the bitterness of their disappointment at his departure, that in this hour their souls should be so burdened and all but overwhelmed with grief. For surely the apostles were absorbed in their grief and trouble, and hence they were de prevented by their own depression from inquiring further into the nature of our Lord's departure. Not that they were altogether incurious and careless concerning this. Some of them had put questions suggested by the Lord's words, but they sank back at once upon their own condition and prospects. If they had turned away from their own loss, if they had followed Christ's declarations concerning himself with interest and faith, if they had asked for further revelations, they would both have forgotten their personal distress, and they would have received the inspiration and fortitude they needed as they realised the victory which would follow the Saviour's humiliation, and as they understood that in that victory they themselves would have a share. Experience has shown us that it is a most deleterious practice to direct thought too much inwardly upon our own sorrows and perplexities, or even upon our joys and comforts. 
religious progress can only be made by fixing the gaze upon of the heart upon him who is infinite excellence and infinite faithfulness. Let our principal interest, therefore, our most earnest questioning, our most ardent affection, be constantly directed toward him, and then sorrow and depression will vanish and peace will reign. The world enjoyed many benefits by reason of Christ's presence. Let's face it, he healed the sick, he taught the ignorant, and was a kind, wise and faithful friend to all men. How much more, then, were the disciples of Jesus indebted to that presence? His immediate friends owed their all, their very selves to him, and could not look forward to losing him without total dismay. And yet our Lord taught that it was really for his people's good that he would leave them, and the experience of the Christian centuries has proved the wisdom and truth of his teaching. The ascension of Christ was the occasion of the descent of the Comforter. The Holy Spirit was indeed no stranger to our humanity even before the Lord's coming, but his influence would be far more widely diffused and more powerfully active than ever previously. Why the coming of the Spirit was made in the wise counsels of God, dependent upon the departure of Jesus, we cannot completely understand. But the events of Pentecost are a matter of scripture history. The records of this dispensation remind us how the Spirit has convinced the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. The Church has never, since our Lord's ascension, ceased to enjoy the enlightening, the quickening and the sanctifying influences of its spiritual comforter. It was necessary that the Son of God and the Saviour of mankind dwell upon earth, and by the deeds of his ministry and by the death of sacrifice, reveal God to his sinful children, furnishing in this way a basis for the spiritual life of humanity. A revealed object of faith was thus provided. But when the manifestation was complete, it was withdrawn. And the special excellence of the Christian faith lies here. It is a faith which calls for, indeed justifies and encourages, faith. Faith in an unseen, but mighty, ever-present, ever-gracious Redeemer and Lord. In them, in him, though now we see him not, yet believing we rejoice. So far as we can see, the bodily presence of Jesus upon earth could not but limit his reign. It could not, well, in such case, be other than partial, local and national. But the purposes of the eternal were comprehensive in benevolence. It was designed that all the ends of the earth should see the salvation of our God. The going away of Jesus assured to the new humanity a divine and heavenly head. By his Spirit, the ascended and glorified Lord is equally present in every part of his dominions. Thus all local limitations are transient, and provision is made for the extension to all of mankind through the blessings of our Saviour's spiritual presence, authority and grace. If Jesus were still on earth, who would not be content to live and loath to die? What prospect would have reconciled his friends to death? But our divine friend has gone on before us, and we can only join him upon the condition of the taking down of this perishable tent in which we dwell today. It is the prospect of going to him 
who has gone away from the earth, which lends brightness to our Christian future. His prayer has secured that, where he is, there also his friends and disciples are waiting for us. Accordingly, an apostle could speak of removing hence as being with Christ, which is far better. And there is no prospect so dear to the Christian's heart as that of ever being with the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on us the armour of light. Now in this time of mortal life, in which your Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen.